everybody. Welcome to the video. We're going to talk about how to write effective instructions today. And this is difficult because most of the instructions you've seen in your life have probably not been great. Some of them have actually probably been pretty terrible. So we don't have much of a baseline usually going into writing instructions because what we see in the world around us is not great. So this is an example of a bad set of instructions. Some of you may see, have seen something like this before. Uh, so this is a set of instructions showing students how to upload an assignment to the D2L Dropbox area. And this is a fairly simple task, and it shouldn't actually have that many steps. But this looks intimidating. It looks very dense. It'd be hard to keep track of where you are, and it's just not good for actually getting a reader to read the instructions. I myself would see this and be like, nope, I'll figure it out on my own. Thank you. So don't do that. Instead, here's the same set of instructions provided in a more clear and concise way. So we have how to submit a file to Assignments Dropbox on D2L. And we have the numbered steps 1 through 11. So there appear to be 11 steps instead of 20, which seems much more doable, right? And the sentences are much shorter as well, so much quicker, easier to read. And we've gotten rid of some other of the bad habits here. So what's the difference? So again, overall it's shorter, more approachable, the sentences are shorter, there are fewer steps to the process, the numbered steps are easier to read and keep track of where we are if we're going step by step through the process. We've removed transitional words like next, then, after, finally. We've removed the use of second person point of view at the beginning of the steps. So instead of saying, you need to now do this, we're just saying do this. And putting verbatim or quoted words in quotes. And then the title uses how to instead of using a long noun phrase string. So part of what makes that set of instructions, the numbered set, better is that it's adhering to the characteristics of what makes good instructions. So first of all, it's chronological, uses numbered steps, has the imperative mood, starts with a base verb, has one main action per step, is short and concise, uses graphics where appropriate and provides plenty of white space where needed, required materials, safety equipment, and special notices are included, feedback needs to be provided at the end of steps, and there's an introduction and a do no statement if needed, and a conclusion if needed. So we're going to go through those one by one here and talk about each of those characteristics. So chronological order means step by step, right? From step 1 to step 20, end of the process. But you'd be surprised how many people have phrases like, before you do this, do this. <laughs> and you already should have completed this before doing this step. And other phrases that indicate that they're steps are either missing steps or are not in chronological order. So make sure you begin at the beginning and you have all of the required steps in order. And then if there are multiple ways to complete the steps, so you could do it in several different orders, sometimes that happens. However, for the clarity of your reader, instead of showing them the same steps in three different orders, I would recommend just providing one set of step-by-step -step instructions and then acknowledging at the beginning that there are multiple ways to do this. Here's one of them to avoid any confusion. And when you are done with the process, make sure you end the steps. And that means that any conditional information, any troubleshooting, any maintenance in the future information needs to be separate in either uh, another paragraph or a conclusion so that your reader doesn't confuse it as an actual step. And when you're numbering steps, there are several ways that you can do this and a few ways that you shouldn't do this. So first of all, if it is a set of instructions, do not use bullet point lists instead of a numbered set of lists. Also, it's preferred that you do not use 
the alphabet to try to order your steps, so don't have A, B, C, D. One, we're not used to looking at the alphabet to get a sense of chronological order, and two, that limits your steps to 26 because we have 26 letters in the alphabet. So instead, use numbered steps like you see here, one, two, three, four, five, and so on when you have a virtually unlimited number that you can provide in showing the reader how to complete this process. Another example would be to use one and then have a bullet point list breakout if there's like additional information or feedback you need to provide with step number one to keep it looking clean and like step number one is approachable, it's short, there's just some extra information here so you can choose to do that. Another popular way to number is to use one and then divide step one or task one into 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1 1.3, then move on to task number two, 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, and so on. And that is preferred particularly if you have a very complex or long set of instructions that you can group tasks together and then break those tasks down using 1.1, 1 1.2. 1 and then slightly less popular, but you still probably see it every once in a while, is uh, instead of doing 1.1, you do 1.a, which doesn't roll off the tongue as easy as the numbers, but it is allowed um, that you can do that. And of course, again, your limitation with 1.a, 1.b, 1.c is that there are 26 letters in the alphabet. So if you're breaking down task one, your limit is 1.z, 26 breakdowns, and then you would have to move on. The imperative mood might sound intimidating to some people, but it means basically you're just giving instructions or directions to somebody, telling them what to do. And how you do that is you start with a verb, and it needs to be the base form of the verb. And if it helps, you can think about it as the action word. What action are you telling the reader to take? And you do not use you or you should before that. So if you're saying that you want them to turn on the sprinklers, instead of saying you should turn on the sprinkler, you say turn on the sprinkler. And it's directive, not indicative, not encouraging them to do something, telling them to do something. Um, do not start with transitional words and phrases that, you know, are not necessary. For example, first, after, then, next. Those transitional phrases are useful in an essay, but when you have a numbered set of steps, they're not necessary and actually cause confusion if you have step two after blah, 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 or step three, then do this. It gets confusing because you have double transitions. And make sure that you do not repeat the previous step. So saying once you've done this or once you've completed this before you provide the next step. That's repetitive and can also be confusing that they might think that the step needs to be done twice. And I have a couple examples here. So this is from a list of instructions, step three. Instead of saying, then you should push the blue start button, you would just say, push the blue start button. Step four, instead of saying, after you've pushed start, monitor the liquid filling the cup, you just say, monitor the liquid filling the cup. There are many different words or verbs that you could use to start the steps. Here are a bunch of the more popular ones. You know, for example, add, blend, bring, carry, click, close, cut, draw, ensure, get, hit, hold, so on. Uh, these are just some examples. There are many, many to choose from. And make sure that you have one main action per step. So each numbered step should be fairly short, and how you do that is to make sure you're telling the reader only to do one thing or one action at a time. And the way you can do that is to look for the verbs. So in our example here, open, select, and click are the verbs that are 
giving instruction direction to your reader telling them what to do there's only one per each step instead of all three of these being combined into one step for example and make sure that overall each step and the entire set of instructions are as short as possible you need to provide all necessary information but nothing more nothing additional which is a tough balance to strike and if you want to provide visuals that's a great way to provide a lot of information and reduce the number of words needed so they say a picture is worth a thousand words kind of <laughs> like maybe not a thousand but you can definitely reduce your description of what needs to be done if you can actually show it with a visual of some kind and so make sure that your instructions are providing the right length here so for example if you're telling someone to call 911, it's too short to just say call 911 because if somebody doesn't know how to do that, saying, hey, call 911 is not going to help, right? Um, you don't want to have instructions that are too long, though. So, for example, on the right here, first, determine if there is an emergency. If there is an emergency that needs to be reported to authorities, do the following. Step two, find a phone. Step three, pick up the phone if it is a landline. Open the phone if it is a cell phone and navigate to the screen, so on and so on and so on. Too long, one, too much information, two, this is an emergency situation. If they're actually following instructions, they don't have that kind of time to read an essay length set of instructions. So just right in the middle, you know, find a phone, step two, enable phone to dial a number. That's a tricky one because it's like, is it a landline? That means pick it up. If it's a cell phone, push the home button, right? But if we don't know what kind of phone they're using, that's where the tricky part comes in. Uh, we're going to assume that they know how to use that phone to dial a number with that step. Then step three, dial nine, dial one, dial one, so that they don't think they're looking for a button that says 911, but that they're actually dialing each number individually, and then press the call button. And when you're including graphics, make sure you're putting them where it's appropriate. So types of graphics can include screenshots, callouts. Um, that's where you can break out different parts of a, an object and point out different parts of it. Uh, you can create a diagram, illustration, picture, map, or a graph. Those are the most popular. And when you are including a visual, make sure that you put it immediately after the step that talks about it. So for example, here we have step 1.1, navigate to your Outlook inbox. Step 1.2, click on the other tab at the top left of the screen. And so you can see here, if we're going to show a screenshot of that, because it is kind of vague, like where's this other tab that we're talking about? Um, you would put that graphic immediately following step number 1.2 before the next step moves on. And make sure that you leave plenty of white space around the graphics and between the text so that it doesn't look cluttered. And I'll show you an example of that. This is way too much. <laughs> too cluttered, too much going on. I can appreciate that they're trying to put a lot of information on one sheet of paper but it's not effective it's hard to read I don't like the look of it in addition they've altered the margins and we're used to 1.0 or 0.7 inch margins you know for most documents so it's a little too close to the edge of the document for most readers so here's an another example it's gonna create a longer document but it's gonna be easier for the person to read and feel more comfortable with where they are in the process as well as if they ever wanted to take notes print this out and take notes on it uh, they have room to do that as well so required materials safety and special notices this is tricky because the information could come at the beginning of the document or it could come throughout uh, so if materials are required, such as um, special equipment or materials just to be able to do the job, safety gear, ingredients, etc., um, you want to provide those as a bullet point list of required materials before the instructional steps 
actually begin because I don't know about you but I've started processes before and then they're like and now use this and I didn't know that thing was needed and I had to drop what I was doing and go find or go buy whatever they told me and that's not great especially if the process is time sensitive or you don't need it to get done right if the reader needs certain knowledge or certificates or experience to safely perform the process, you should note that before the instructional steps so they can determine, do I have this knowledge? Do I have this certificate? Do I have this experience? If not, they need to find someone else. And special notices are the notes, um, warnings, and you know danger any kind of notice that you would provide that's calling out important information and you use different levels to indicate levels of danger. And you, if it's applying to the whole process, you would want to put it at the beginning of the, the whole set of instructions. If it is something that is needed, you want to put it before the instructional step. So, uh, if it's something that's needed just for one step, you put it before that step so that they don't try to do the step and then read that there was some kind of special notice that they needed. So we have some examples here of special notices. Note is the least important. It's still important enough that you're going to call it out as a note, but it is not dangerous in any way. So it's used for tips or suggestions that are helpful in completing a process or can save people time, energy. Um, so the example here, note, two types of setups are available. The basic setup is recommended for most users. The professional setup is recommended for people with two plus years of experience using the program. Then moving on, we have caution, which almost always shows up with yellow, some way, shape, or form, including yellow. And that is used to alert readers to potential risk. And that is anywhere from moderate injury to serious equipment damage. So if the person doing the steps in the instructions can hurt themselves uh, or seriously damage equipment, you would want to use a caution to let them know. So for example, caution. Be sure the machine is cool to the touch before opening the door to work on the engine. And the takeaway there is that you're probably going to burn yourself if it's not, right? The next one you have is warning. It almost always is accompanied by orange to help draw attention to it. And you should use this pretty rarely. It's used to alert readers about potential risks ranging from serious injury to death or destruction of equipment. And sometimes you'll see it in all caps, sometimes it'll be upper lowercase, but it'll say warning. To prevent serious injury, make sure the chain is not engaged before turning on the engine. And then we have red on the very right here that says danger. Very rarely use this. You don't want to use it all the time because it desensitizes people to the dangerous nature of tasks that we do. And it's used to alert readers about immediate and serious hazards that would most likely be fatal. So danger, extremely high voltage, stay back at least six feet. Often is all caps to again, draw attention to itself and almost always is red or has red accent to draw attention to it. Feedback statements can be confusing if you're thinking about writing and giving feedback to other writers receiving feedback yourself. But that's not what we mean when we're talking about feedback statements and instructions. So feedback statements are actually anticipatory pieces of information that you're providing to your reader to help them navigate the process. So it's not an actual step, but it's supplemental information that you anticipate them needing to be able to successfully complete the step. So they immediately follow the step that they're referring to. So, for example, you can tell people, people what should happen after they complete a step. So if the step is press the start button, the feedback would be the program should run in a black box behind any open windows on the computer. That is what should happen if you have successfully completed that step.
or you could provide instructions on what to do if something goes wrong. So for example, check on the cake every five minutes while baking. If cake appears to be cooking too quickly, reduce oven 325 degrees to make sure the middle of the cake gets cooked. So what's read there is what you do in case there's a problem, how you can fix it. Or you could provide instruction for any conditional situation, any if situation. So step, uh, the actual step, check to see if any email addresses or domains are blocked that shouldn't be. If any email addresses or domains such as the company-wide email domain uh, shouldn't be blocked, select the email address or domain, click remove, and click OK. So you can't make the red here an actual step because not everybody will have blocked addresses that they need to remove. It's a conditional if statement and what they should do if there is something that they need to fix. And sometimes, not always, but sometimes you'll need to provide introductions for instructions. And it's up to you to determine if you need to do that. But it can help the reader figure out what you're trying to do, who you're talking to, and so on. So if you do include an introduction, make sure you identify the audience, the purpose, and the context. So for example, for this document, how to troubleshoot your Outlook inbox for missing emails, the introduction is saying who this is affecting. So many careers under construction employees have recently contacted IT with concerns about not re receiving emails in their inbox, particularly important company-wide emails. And then you need to include any safety measures, materials needed, and special notices if they apply to the whole process and get those out there to readers before they begin the instructional steps and include a do no statement or what's also called the statement of purpose. And in the example, you can see it here is the second red box. So notice it's following the context, but it's very close to the beginning, one sentence later from the very beginning of the document. And it says this document shows you how to check your Outlook account folders and settings to make sure that you are able to receive and find emails from appropriate senders. So that is the do no statement. It's something that you will know how to do once you've completed reading the document. And then for conclusions, again, if a conclusion is needed, it's up to you to determine that, but a conclusion can include this kind of material. Um, a statement that a reader has completed the task may sound pretty obvious, but if these are printed instructions, people may feel like you're missing some information or you're missing a step if you get to the last step and that's it. They may say, oh, was that the last step or am I missing a page here? Or you could also include a description of what the reader does in the future if that is not part of this particular process. So for example, if there are maintenance tips or how, how to troubleshoot for the future, you can provide that information in the conclusion. And then if there's Anywhere you want to send them, if they're encountering difficulties in completing the process, you can provide that contact information or process as well. So for example here, if after trying to fix each possible issue, you are still not receiving emails, contact, and it provides the contact email. So let's take a quick peek at the example document that we've been looking at bits and pieces of throughout here as examples. So here, this is formatted as an inner office memorandum or a memo, which means that it is meant for internal audiences within the company and it's giving them important information. So in this case, instructions on how to do something. And you can see it says to all staff from a person or department, subject, how to troubleshoot your Outlook inbox for missing emails, date, of when it is published or sent. And then it has the introduction information and it's listing the three most likely causes for not receiving or finding emails in their inbox. And it's um, automatic sort to other folders, the address being on the blocked senders list or the email not being on the personal safe senders list. And so there are three sections here, 
steps for how to deal with each of those. So if you have automatic sort on, where to look for that information. If you have the person on the blocked senders list, where to find that list and make edits to your blocked senders list. And then if you want, you can add people to your safe senders list and then there's instructions on how to do that. And so that is just an example of a set of instructions that is here adhering to our list of good characteristics for an instructional document.